Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 55. And Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and, the, and head across the lake to Bethsaida, where he sent the people home. After telling everybody, excuse me, everybody goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking into the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat, and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed for for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. After they had crossed the lake, they had landed at uh, Gennesaret. Uh, they brought the boat to shore and climbed out. The people recognized Jesus at once, and they ran throughout the whole area, carrying sick people on mats to wherever they heard he was. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for the message this morning that everything goes smoothly and that you would be with Peter when he gives us the message, Lord. I uh, pray for um, that we would understand the message and get to know your word better and have a better relationship with you, Father God. I pray this in your name. Amen. 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 You guys So, um, as Mindy said, we're kind of been living with this word invite a little bit, and last year our kind of word as a church was being very intentional, and uh, part of being intentional is inviting. I think we have a great life together, yeah, and it's great to invite people into life that you're finding with one another, and uh, we have our family gathering today afterwards, you're going to find out a, a kind of an even a new, a newer word for us this year, but I'll tell you right now so you just hear it. It's going to be the word opportunity. And uh, I think we always have opportunities to grow. And I think we have all, always have opportunities to enter in to what Jesus is doing in and around our lives. And so uh, I just want to emphasize a couple that are coming up just as, as your pastor here. Uh, we're going to have uh, two weeks from yesterday. So we'll have a Catalyst training on Saturday, January 26th, and it's in your bulletin. And uh, for those of you who've been in the church a long time, you know this language, membership. So, um, but in living into uh, language that's probably more relevant today uh, and fits who we are as a community, it's an opportunity to learn what it means to partner together in ministry as a family, okay? And I want everybody to come. I want everybody to come. It's going to be from 8.30 to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. We are going to feed you. We are going to love on you. There is child care. So if you have kids, that's not even an issue. And it's going to put us all on the same page as a church family as we move forward. And I think it's really important because a lot of us come from many different backgrounds, and if they even had many different experiences in this very church, and they'll just put us all on the same page. And then we're going to be starting growth groups uh, in February. And you've seen this G2 thing all over the place. And you've seen this phrase growth groups, G2. G2 means two Gs, for those of you who don't. You know, younger generation looks at it and go, I get it. Uh, but those of us that are more mature, sometimes they're like, what's with the G2? Growth groups. And those are groups that are going to meet during the week, and we're just going to get together. We're going to share with one another. We're going to pray together. We're going to reflect on the message from Sunday that you heard and read that passage again and ask a couple of questions. What are we hearing from God? And what should we do with that? And just going to be an hour and a half. And so just so you know, there's going to be one on Monday. There's going to be one on Tuesday. And there's going to be one on Thursday. And then we even have one in the works that will be during the day for those of you who have retired early. And have time available. That was kind, wasn't it, Carolyn? Uh, if you retire, they'd have time free during the day to meet in a group then. So um, at any time, you can sign up on your um, connection card. You can just check off growth group. But I want to send a clipboard around for belong and believe because I have to prepare materials for you for our gathering in two weeks. And so you can sign up and you can see I'm optimistic. There's 32 lines. There's 32. So we're going to run out of room, so you can flip it over on the back, and you can, if you're couples, you can write both your names on there. This just helps us to prepare for you guys. And then
And then if you didn't have a chance to sign up to help for TGIF, you can flip the page if you know what that is. Can you start that? All right. So, I brought my glasses today. If you were here last Sunday, you saw I was struggling to <laughs> read my Bible badly, and I should have just borrowed glasses from somebody in here, because we do have a lot of those around. So, um, I don't know if you guys can remember this. If you're young, you have no clue what I'm talking about. But when I was in high school, they taught driver's ed. And not only did they teach driver's ed, they had on your campus a trailer that had simulators in it. Yep. Remember those? Yep. You could actually sit there and learn how to... And then the school actually owned driver's ed cars. And then usually they roped the coaches into doing this. I don't know why it was the coaches, but the coaches would you take a few students out in a car on <coughs> Saturday and you would learn how to drive. And then these cars had this unique thing in them on the, the passenger side in the front seat there was a break, so if you, were, if you were just doing a bad job behind the wheel, the, the coach could just go, er, and stop the car. So um, anyway, I was an urban boy, and I, and I know growing up here, many of you were probably behind the wheel of something with an accelerator um, early on in life, but I didn't have that experience. And, and so when I did all this driver's training stuff, I went to a class, we had a book, and I learned all the rules. And, um, and I even was able to go down to the DMV and take the test and pass it. Yay! And then I did the simulators. And you saw a film and, and you drove in the simulator. But I'll never forget that first Saturday. Me and another guy and a girl who I will just say should have never been behind the wheel of a car because when it was her turn to drive, she went off the road and took out a fence. But that's, <laughs> I, I, I digress. But anyway, I remember I was the first one asked to get behind the wheel. And I remember, I, I can still picture this. I got behind, the car was white, I think it was a Chevy. And I got behind and I did my seatbelt. And, and then I kind of froze a little bit. He said, check the mirrors. So I checked the mirrors. And he goes, all right, start the car. And I was like, I kind of froze up. I'm like, this isn't like the simulator. I mean, <laughs> And now I'm feeling really stupid because I'm a 16 year old boy and this is just bad. And he goes, turn the key. <laughs> so I turned the key and, goes, rah, 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 and it didn't start. And I, and I look at him and he goes, turn the key. In fact, then you had to give it a little gas. Give it a little gas. I turn it and it starts right up. I'm like, oh. And he's waiting. And I look at him and he goes, put it in drive. <laughs> I mean, the whole time in that car was that experience. I, I'm like looking to him for direction, and, and I take, I knew all, I knew it all, but I didn't know how to actually live into it. And I'll never forget, I grew up in Pleasant Hill, so we went into Walnut Creek, so you're driving down roads you're not familiar with, and there was this one road that you, you went along like this, and then it crossed um, the 24, and it was a road that was really steep and went like that. So I'm, I turn and I go up this street, and I'm halfway up it, and he reaches over and he turns off the car. And I'm like, and the car starts to roll back and he, and he looks at me and he says, put on the brake. And I'm panicking and so he puts on the brake. He says, put it in part and just freaked me out. So needless to say, I did learn how to drive. I did pass my driver's test, parallel parked and everything, all's good. So as we've been in the Gospel of Mark, we're looking at Jesus, we're looking at how he lived life, how he showed his disciples to live life. And we reached a turning point. We got to see all the stuff that Jesus was doing as the disciples were following him. But when you get to Matthew chapter 6, all of a sudden it changes. Jesus is now saying, I've shown you all of these things. Now you guys get to play. You're not just going to be spectators anymore. This new kingdom that I'm talking about, all the things that I'm doing right now that are ushering us in a whole new direction, you actually get to do this. And that was Jesus' plan from the very beginning. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. And what that meant, repent meant the direction you're going isn't the right one. We're going to turn. We're going to go this way. And the way that you believe is you actually do that. And so now it's their turn. Prior to what we're going to look at today, Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs. Kind of gave them some instructions and said, go do it. And I would imagine when they went out, it was a little crazy as they lived into it, but then they got to see it work. And then they came back and hung out with him. 
And they began to process. And so as we continue, even looking at what we're looking at today, you, you see that there's these steps of faith that you sort of have to take to begin to live into it. I think a lot of us have a faith in our head. We believe. A lot of us, it's gravitated to our heart because we've experienced it. But for many of us, it's yet to go to our hands where we actually go do the very thing um, that we believe. So I've shared this with our leaders at church. It's kind of an interesting thing. It's called the leadership square. And it's kind of what Jesus is modeling for us. And I think it's the way we ought to do life. Jesus invited the disciples to follow him. And then in turn, he's going to ask the disciples to disciple other people. And that's really what we're supposed to do as followers of Christ. We're supposed to invite people into our lives, show them how to live, and empower them so that they can live that life and show others. And so, uh, Matthew, can you put that slide up there? There we go. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this before, but if you think about it, it makes sense. I do you watch. So if I say, I want to teach you how to do something, I want to mentor you, I want to coach you, or I want to disciple you. You're watching me as I do it. But the next step is that I do it, and now you help me do it. So now you're going to put your hands on it. You're going to actually get to do it. And then the next step is you do it, and I help you. And if anything, it's more observational. And at the very end, you do it, I let go, it's yours, and I watch. And that's the journey that our disciples are living into. And it's a great model. All Jesus asked of his disciples was to set aside everything. And come along and follow him and live into this. And as we saw when Jesus fed the 5,000, he modeled a great rhythm to live into, the way it actually looks. If you recall, Jesus' goal was to go retreat and spend time. He modeled that for the disciples. You need to have a relationship with the Father to do any of this. You've got to have that. He modeled for them that you need to be able to look at the world around you and have compassion for it. And recognize the needs in it. And you have to be willing then to be inconvenienced in order to step into what I'm about. And then he said, what do you have? Bring all that you have and give it to me and I will bless it. And then you need to go out and you need to bless other people with it. And that's what he did. And that's where we pick up our story um, today. So picture this. They were exhausted from going out by twos. They get inconvenienced and then they spend a day. 12 men, feeding thousands of people. Talk about operating off no sleep. Okay, thousands of people. And then at the end, it says they went around with baskets and they picked up all the food. Jesus can tell they're tired, exhausted, and we need to move on. So I want you guys to get in the boat and I want you to go back across the Sea of Galilee. This is the end of the day. This is night. And we've talked about this before. You don't go out on this body of water at night. And he's sending them away. And he's sending them to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to a place called Bethsaida. Which is north of a place we talked about before. Which is part of the Decapolis. Which was a place that a good Jew didn't go. So he's sending them into dangerous waters again. To a place where they're probably going, oh my gosh, we're going over there again? I hope it's a better place. And then as Caleb read, it says that Jesus went to the crowds, thousands of people. I don't know how he did it, but he said, you guys need to go. You're blessed. You need to go. And he, he sends them all away. And then it says that Jesus went off to be by himself, to be with his father. Again, he took that time to be with his father. Meanwhile, the disciples are where? They're out in the Sea of Galilee. And what happens? A storm comes up. They're already exhausted from days worth of ministry. And they're in a boat, and they're exhausted, and it says they're straining just to keep the boat going. And Jesus, of course, is nowhere to be found. It says they did this all night. I don't know if you've ever rowed a boat before. Betsy and I kayak a little bit, and we're probably not good for more than a few hours. And these guys are out in tossing waters and everything, and they did it all night. And in the midst of that, in the early morning... They see an image of someone walking on the water towards them. In the stormy waters, and they see it at first, and I would imagine they're just delirious from being so tired. It's like, are we dreaming? This is crazy scary. There's someone walking on the water. Is it a ghost? And the reality is it's not a ghost. It's Jesus walking on water. Now, there are scientists who've tried to debunk this and figure this whole thing out. How, how can you walk on water? And if you've watched some shows before, I mean... There's magicians who try to pull it off. They put stuff under the water. It makes it look like they walk and everything. 
Well, science has actually figured out if you wanted to do this yourself, so if you want to go out and try this, this is what it takes. If you're running at 67 miles per hour, you can actually <laughs> stay on top of the water. So, try that. So Jesus is coming out, and uh, they freak out, but then they realize it's him. Now, you have the exact same account in a couple other Gospels. And in the Gospel of Matthew, in the same account, after feeding the 5,000, Jesus comes out of the water, and you have these disciples in the boat. Now, they've been watching everything that Jesus has been doing. I mean, he's shown, Jesus showed he has authority over everything. I mean, he's healed people. I mean, he's saying things. He's doing things. They just fed 5,000 people. And Peter's in the boat, and he's like, I want to do that. In the midst of the storm, all the other disciples are probably going, are you crazy? And Peter's like, hey, if, if Jesus is doing all kinds of crazy things. I want to do this too. And so Jesus says, come on out of the boat. And so Peter steps out of the boat and starts to walk. And it's working, but it's stormy. So what does he do? He looks around at the storm, and he starts to sink. And I would imagine he started to freak out. Doubt, fear, all of it. And Jesus reaches out his hand and tells him, keep your eyes on me. And he comes right back up out of the water and they get back in the boat. Wow. The minute they got back in the boat, the storm stopped. It says that they ended up south of Capernaum where they had just been. They never ended up in Bethsaida. They ended up in a town south of where they intended to go. And it says when they got out of the boat, word had spread that Jesus was there, and people's response was to go find anybody that they knew that needed to be healed in some form, whether it was mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, even if it meant putting them on a mat, and they brought them to Jesus. And it says at the end of the passage there that Caleb didn't read, it says that the people just hoped that Jesus would touch them or that they could touch him because they believed that if they did, they would get their life back. Wow. Isn't that a crazy story? I think there's a lot in that for us, but there was three things that just stood out to me that I want to share with you this morning, just three. And um, for me, they're very significant, personally, because I, I, I know in my uh, following Jesus, I have to revisit this constantly. I have to revisit this constantly because I find myself taking my eyes off of Jesus I find myself in storms and everything, and I try to muscle. And there's nothing that he can't do. Jesus cares so much about all people, and we need to realize there is nothing that he can do. When you look at the life that he lived and the lives that he impacted, things that changed people's lives to actually raising someone from the dead who died. Things happen, make it better myself. And it really doesn't matter what it is. It's like our first go-to. And I think it's because we forget that Jesus has an unwavering compassion and love and ability to redeem every area of our life. If we will just, if we will just trust him with it. He can't do anything. There's nothing he can't do. But the thing I've noticed about that is he does it in the lives of people. I think for many of us in the world today, we're, we're looking at the world around us, and it's pretty crazy, and we might be afraid of what lies ahead and all that kind of stuff, all this uncertainty and, and stuff, and we're looking out there and hoping that it'll change out there. Can God just step in and change that? He could, but you know what? I think he starts here. I've heard it said before, the change you want to see in the world begins with so what needs to happen in your life that you need to trust Jesus with? Second thing that stood out to me, Jesus will show up in the midst of our greatest storms. Meaning when we hit the hardest part of our lives, the worst moments, like you get the phone call that the test results are back and you have cancer and we're doing surgery tonight. I've had that phone call. Uh... You know the job?
you're working right now, well, we have to let you go. Uh, the paycheck you were planning on isn't coming. And on and on and on. All of those different things that happen catch us off guard. When that happens, I think many of us, our first response is, where is God in this? Right? Because if God was here, that wouldn't happen. Not so. We live, in a, we live in a fallen world. Stuff happens. Stuff happens. If you're looking for Jesus, he shows up. I've shared this with many of you before, a, a while back, but my son had a bad moment in college where he um, partied, and he wasn't a partier. He partied for over a week without stopping and did something that got him arrested, and he was facing two felonies, and I get that phone. Where's God in this? <laughs> right? And I remember on, being on my knees on a weekend, anguishing as he's in jail, and I have to wait till Monday to find out what was really going on and what are we going to do. And da, da, da. So you can imagine what's running through my head and my heart. It was the deepest moment of anguish, probably in my entire life, to know that my son, whom I love, who's never done anything wrong, has done something. It's going to cause who knows what. And you know where I found myself? On my knees. It's the only place I could go. With the book of Psalms in the middle of the Bible, if you haven't read it, it's the journey of that's the struggle I'm talking about. And I started at Psalm 1, and I just, I had to pray these prayers that were David's prayers. And I just worked through it through the entire nights. I remember Saturday night, I could not sleep, and I spent the entire night praying those prayers. And I started to feel a sense that God's, God's in this. The miracles that unfolded, Betsy was there, and I won't go into the details of it, but literally on Monday, God just started to work. By Tuesday, I had my son out. Everything was reduced to misdemeanors, and we had an amazing attorney to help my son journey through this. Like that. And I will never forget that. I mean, God showed up in a huge way. And then he redeemed that in my son's life. My son's a worship leader at a church and a father and everything, and he's doing great. God will show up in the midst of your storms. Jesus will show up in the midst of your storms. The Holy Spirit will work in you and use those terrible moments in your life to do an amazing work. You will be a different person on the other side of it, and your faith will be completely different. To the point that you might even have that faith that Peter has. That you're like, next time a storm comes up, I'm walking on it. I'm going to step right into it, which leads me to my last one. All we have to do is take a step of faith, and we will be amazed at what happens. And sometimes that step of faith can be a little baby one, or it needs to be a huge one. It doesn't matter. The step, the size of the step doesn't matter. I think many of us know in our life right now an area of our life that we wish was different, that we wish was better. It would live into the thing that we're hoping for. It would be the desire of our heart. But it requires a step on our part. And for many of us, we are afraid to take the step. Because if I take the step, what? You don't know the answer to what? If I take the step, how? Well, I don't know the answer to how. If I take the step, when? I don't. And so we don't do it. I think we're well aware, all of us, that there are things that we might want to do different. Situations we might want to step into. Things we might want to say. Things we might want to start doing. Things we might want to stop doing. I, I think we all know them. But many of us, we just don't do it. We don't do it. Think of God's people. Back in Moses' time, some of you know the story. They were enslaved by the Egyptians. For centuries. And Moses, and that's a whole other story, does what God asks. He goes, go free my people. But here's the step of faith. He goes to all those people. Slavery is all they know, but at least they know it. And Moses says, pack up everything, we're going. Are you sure? Yeah. I've talked with Pharaoh. Pack it up, we're going. Thousands of people pack up what they can carry and they go with them. Where? Out into the desert. And as they're going, they're probably thinking, 
Are all the soldiers like going to come after us and kill us? And they get to a body of water, and yes, the Egyptians are coming to kill them. And they're facing a body of water. And Moses just like, step in. Can you imagine stepping on the edge of the water? It's all muddy and murky and everything. And it's actually a river, so it's moving. And, and they're stepping into it in the faith that somehow they're going to get across it. And I wonder if Moses even waited until they walked in a little bit. And then he went, oh, step away. <laughs> we know the story. Um, being a grandparent and having the privilege of watching um, children learn to walk again. And so my two grandsons, Noah and Malachi, they're about the same age, were at our house over Christmas, and they're right at that stage. And, and think about this. These kids are learning how to walk, and you're the parent or the grandparent. You're, you want them to walk, right? So you're like, come on, you can do it. Get up. And they're, they're walking along furniture. They're doing all this stuff, and they sit down on their rear end. But then all of a sudden, they, they stand up, and their awkwardness and teary, it's like this whole thing, and they take a step, and they go down. And as parents, what do we do? We're like, oh, yeah, that was we cheer them, we encourage them, right? We're celebrating it. In fact, they take a few steps, we're taking pictures, we're videotaping it, we're sending it out to everybody we know. This is the greatest <laughs> thing, right? And when they fall, you don't go, oh, loser, you blew it. What are you thinking? <laughs> right? We don't do that. Do we? <laughs> no, you don't do that. <laughs> so I want you to think about this. David writes in Psalms, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. And though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him in his hands. Think about this. When you take a step of faith, you've listened to God and you take that step of faith, you need to know that the Father in heaven, Jesus himself, and the Holy Spirit, they're encouraging you. Every step you take, they're celebrating you. When you stumble and fall, they're encouraging you to get back up. They are cheering for you. You have a cheering section that I think we often forget that we have. Richard Rohr, who's an author I love to read, uh, wrote this book called um, The Divine Dance. And it's about the Trinity, so if you struggle with understanding Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just a great book. But one of the things that he wrote in this book that just stood with me, and it just reminds me, and I repeat this to myself every day. We have a God who's for us. We have Jesus who is always beside us. And we have the Holy Spirit who is always within us. That never goes away. It's the ultimate sharing section. You can put your hope in that. But the only way you're going to know how that works is you just have to begin to say yes. You have to begin to take those steps. So my question to you this morning is what... Has God been asking of you? What step has he been probing you with? Maybe you've been thinking about it and didn't realize that maybe it was actually him that's telling you to take this step. Is there a conversation you need to have? Is there something you do need to start doing? Is there something that you need to stop doing? Is there a situation you need to get yourself out of? Is there something in your past you need to face? I want to challenge you to take that step. Uh, you will not be disappointed. It may be hard, and you may fall down, but in the end, it's going to bear fruit like you can't even imagine. You will find that moment where you're back in the boat, and the storm calms. And the cool thing is, you thought you were going to end up over here, and you might actually end up in a place that you didn't have, have even thought of before. Amen? So I want you to take a moment, I want you to close your eyes and think about what has the Lord been asking of you There's a song that I was taught years ago when I was a kid, and the chorus is this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. 
and the things of earth will look strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I think the thing that causes us to not take steps of faith is fear. We're afraid. And you need to know in Scripture it says that perfect love casts out all fear. God loves us. Uh, from my devotion this morning in Isaiah, I mean, it's crazy how God works. I was literally reading this this morning as my reading. It says, but now listen to the Lord who created you. The one who formed you says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. And why? Because God's love for us is so great. So I want you to stand. I want to teach you a song um, that we've been learning that I think speaks to this. And this might be a song you just need to listen to. But it also might be something that you need to proclaim by singing it. Let me teach you the chorus.
And we're looking for a way out. And as our Father, you look at it and, and you want to cheer us to get up and walk. So, I, Lord, I pray for whatever was reflected on this morning that you would encourage each person here to take that step. And may they keep their eyes focused on you. Keep their eyes focused on Jesus and know that your Holy Spirit is in them and working around them and going before them. And it's in that that they will find victory over whatever it is. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if we can have our ushers come forward. So if you're visiting with us for the first time, just know that uh, our tithes and offerings here go directly into ministry. We're passionate about that. But if you are visiting, don't feel obligated to give at all unless the Lord puts it on your heart. And if you did fill out one of those connection cards so we can get to know you, you get to know us, you can drop that in the plate. Okay, hey, uh, please pray, pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are so, so good. We thank you for, for all the blessings today. And today we realize that it's a special gift, an unrepeatable gift, Lord. Uh, we ask you to open our hearts and minds and fill us with your grace, Lord. Please accept these offerings this morning in your honor. We give you all the glory, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs> shared with us earlier about the driving test. Uh, we got a fear of things that we don't know. And uh, that, that keeps us from stepping out. And uh, I ask that the blessing for all you is to look beyond that. Just like obviously Peter did He's driving now. He seems to be doing okay. <laughs> but he didn't know how to put it in drive. He didn't know how to put it in drive. He just was afraid to put it in drive and to live into it. And uh, fear does play a big part of our lives. Uh, even though we don't acknowledge it all the time, it, 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 it's a fear of uh, living it out. And uh, 
We have, we have Christ with us. God is, he, he's our maker. And he sent his son and also the Holy Spirit to be with us. So really what do we have to fear? You know? So I ask that that blessing of stepping out and beyond fear would be with you, all you, this week. And I also have something very important, uh, and I want to ask Johnny, if you would, Johnny, could you come up here with me? Um, John's mom is kind of in her last days, and, and Johnny's been struggling, um, and he's a, he's a close brother, um, and he has a he has a niece that uh, needs some prayers and. Could you, could you share a little bit of that, John? Yeah. Um, sorry for the way that I look, but I just rushed over here from San Francisco. Every Friday, I go spend time with my mom that, uh, you know, she's her time is limited. You know, she has uh, dementia really, really bad. And she's been struggling with cancer for the last four years, and now the cancer spread everywhere where, you know, they just sent her home. And, and um, we just take care of her, you know, my family and I, my sister, myself, and my niece, Serena. And, uh, you know, like I tell Steve, this, this man right here, you know, you guys know him and you guys, I don't need to explain it. He's like a father figure to me, you know, I grew up without a dad. Him and Michael Mosley, I know you, you guys know Michael. They, uh, I, I don't even have words to express how they are towards me. And, you know, they don't really, really know me, know me. So with my mom, um, you know, my conscience, like I tell Steve, is good because I've done everything I can for her and be there for her. And, and, and now I know how it is, you know, how we, uh, when they, our parents take care of us, when we're little, diapers and everything, this and that, that's exactly what I'm doing now. And uh, you guys, I still have your mom and dad alive, you know, every family member, you know, always tell them how much you guys love them. Call them, trust me, love, love your, your parents, your family, your friends, even if you have uh, any problems with family members or friends, whatever, let, let all that go, you know. I, I sit down with my mom, and I, you know, I sometimes she she think, knows who I am, and she doesn't. She doesn't. She calls me like a whole different like, names I don't even know. And then uh, she always puts her hand in my face, and she always tells me, "I go, Mom, what am I gonna do without you?" Right? And she always tells me, "She goes, just love, love, love." She goes, "Love everybody, even people that do you wrong." She goes, "That's the best advice that I can give you." And then she goes, and "Stop asking me that anymore." So, um, Serena, my, my niece, came all the way from Costa Rica to help us with her because my job, and I'm out here, and my sister. So she takes care of my mom. She goes to school, and she works. And then when she's off of work, she comes and spends the night with my mom. So she's passed her driving test three times. I mean, the, the written test, which I think it's harder than the driving test. And she can't pass her driving test. So to, tomorrow morning at 8.30 in Hayward, she has her driving test. So this morning when I was leaving, she just stopped me really quick and she told me to please have, to please pray for her. And I told her I was going to go to church and for all the church to please pray for her so she could pass the test because she needs to go pick up medicine for my mom. She has to take her to sometimes to our appointments. And even though everything's really close, you know, she's driving without a license and she gets pulled over. She's in trouble and the car taken away. It's just a bad situation. And even though she's doing something good, you know, I tell you, you know, even the Lord has, you know, scripture that you have to follow the laws of the land and you have to do everything right. So her name is Serena. She has a driving test on Monday morning. And just please pray for her that, you know, that God touches the, the instructor's heart. That maybe it's a little bit rainy or kind of ugly weather that he wants to get out of there quick or her, you know, you pass, you know, but, you know, you don't, you don't, you know, God does miracles. So I just want to, you know, and that's it. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now humbly and ask for help in our needs. And right now, we, we want to uh, pray for Serena right now that uh, you'd be with her tomorrow on the test. And that uh, all of what she has learned that will come to her and, and she'll have that faith and not that fear and to be able to pass that test that she can help her grandmother that is uh, in her final days and we just ask this to be a blessing upon her in Christ's name, Amen Thank you So we have our family gathering um, at about probably 11, 10 so we always have
So if you're visiting with us, we always have a food bag that we give you. So feel free to come and hang out with us. And even if you're new, you want to kind of find out how family works here, you can stay. So uh, be blessed, and uh, we will see all of you sooner than later. out of it. At least the days aren't areas. <laughs> they must let the snow. <laughs> they must well, set the snow. The one that lives in Utah loves skiing. Really? That's, that was part of the appeal. Oh.
And the sound is pretty good now. Oh, yeah. We can hear you good. And so all I need is, if you don't mind writing down the site again for sure.